So we're broadcasting live and we've got attendees coming in now. So we'll just give everyone 20 seconds for hopefully the, the, the bugs to work out and and we'll uh, we'll get started with Michael Campbell. So uh, a very big welcome to the second session. I hope you found this morning's session uh, worthwhile and useful, and some, grabbing something that you can use uh, in, your, in your practices going forward. Uh, we're now jumping into the beef concurrent session and we've got a number of interesting talks from some great colleagues of, of mine and a few that I haven't met yet, but I'm sure I'll, I'll learn all about. Um, we're kicking off with Michael Campbell this morning. Michael's a lecturer in the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences and has uh, interest in the in the, uh, the the dairy beef industry. So we're gonna gonna hand over to Michael, uh, and if, I'll ask all of our presenters to turn off their cameras. Uh, and Michael, you can leave yours on. Open. Okay, so hopefully, Michael, you can see your uh, yep, slides good there. To go. Perfect. No, terrific. Thanks, thanks for that, Tom, and um, and thanks everyone for for uh, attending this. I'm actually really enjoying. I enjoyed that first session, and I appreciate uh, all the effort Tony Nugent and the teams put into um, putting this on today. So, what? Um, so I just get control of this here. <laughs> So essentially, the um, what we did last year was it conducted a trial, um, MLA funded trial, looking at trying to um, extract more value out of cull cows. And um, we all know, and it's been spruced on about it for the last few years around Australia becoming a, a very high cost beef producer. So we've got high electricity costs, high labour costs, um, and, and now we've got high, high cost of cattle as well. And so a lot of our meat processors have been um, been telling us for a while that we need to be playing in this high quality branded beef product market. And you, you see companies such as the, the AACO, Australian Agricultural Company, who have, who have shifted away from talking about themselves as a beef producer into um, talking about themselves as a, um, as a branded beef supplier. And, um, and so they're you know, one of the largest Wagyu herds in the, in the country. So it's shifted away from this commodity um, thinking. So essentially saying that rather than selling our meat on a commodity basis, which is um, all, all driven by um, market spot markets at the, at the time. Um, we need to shift away from that and, and start thinking about how do we get premium product going through our abattoirs all the time. Now, an avenue um, that we haven't explored greatly is the um, utilisation of, of cull cows for a premium product. So, as you can see here, um, a typical market for cull cows is uh, sorry, I'll just click back on there. Uh, what we see is that cull cows are uh, basically, uh, as the weight increases, we get a higher cents per kilo rate for our cow cows. So it's all driven by yield. And a lot of those cows will end up going to grinding beef. And so end up in hamburger patties or um, or um, other sort of processed products. So you can see here that, you know, on the, this is coming out of a Walker sale yard market report, a lighter cow, 400 to um, 500 kilograms, 283 cents a kilo. But then when we um, increase the weight, we can get um, an increased cents per kilo. So that's not new. That's been around for a long time, hence why we, we try and um, put weight onto cull cows. Um, when we look at a processor grid, um, and this is a standard one that we've grabbed off the internet here, you can see that the, the heavier the cows, um, the higher the cents per kilo. So that's all, all well known. But Essentially, if we if we play in this game, we're still playing in the commodity game. We're just getting more kilos of beef, and the reason we're getting paid more for them is is basically a yield. Um, you know, we can make more money from the boning room yield out of these cows. So, what our project sought to 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 do was say, well, okay, it's one thing to feed cows for a period of time, and, and that might be on pasture or in a feedlot. There's plenty of people feeding cattle in feedlot, um, old cows in feedlots at the moment. Um, and have been for a few years, but but what does that mean in terms of quality? Can we extract more value out of these cull cows? Can we get a quality product, even just for a, a few of the primal cuts? You know, some of our cube rolls, which is where our Scotch fillets come from, or a strip loin, where our sirloin steak come from. So we we got um, we we're lucky enough to work with a producer who was already had cows identified who had come out of a drought, and um, we're selling some to slaughter anyway. 
So we, we grabbed um, some of their cows. So they sent some to slaughter and we fed the others at CSU. So we had four groups. We had a day zero, which went to straight to slaughter, and then a day 28, so four weeks on feed, 42 days, which is six weeks on feed, and 56 days on feed. We fed a really basic diet. So pellets, so grain-based pre-formulated pellet, and then we used hay and a bit of um, straw to balance the diet uh, to try and reduce costs at the time. Uh, and you can see there that essentially we, we fed about 70% of the pellets and then the, the rest of the, the diet came from the roughage and 5% from canola meal. We fed them uh, on a twice daily basis, so morning and afternoon, and we measured everything that went into the pen. So on a pen basis, we had um, we had feed intake, and then once a week we, we um, cleaned the feed troughs out, and that was our feed refusals for the week. So you can see it's a pretty basic diet. It's not a high spec feedlot diet or anything like that. It was it, what we were trying to achieve was something that um, any farmer could probably achieve in a small paddock. We followed the cattle through to slaughter, identified them at slaughter. Um, did full MSA grading on the cattle. We we have then taken meat samples out and we've fabricated them into consumer samples. Now they were meant to be eaten already, um, but with COVID-19 this year, we've had to delay a fair bit of our consumer sensory research. And so we um, we will be eating them very soon. Um, and that's that's a key part of this project. So what, um, sorry, I'll just highlight there. So in terms of the diet here, we've got um, only 10 and a half megajoules of energy and 15% crude protein, which I think is, you know, one of those diets that you could achieve quite comfortably at home if you, um, without having any expensive equipment. So what did we see? And I think this is what we're, we're all keen to see is that as we fed for a period of time, it's what we expected, that quality increased. So the first cows, you can see here on the left-hand side, and um, I probably shouldn't be too critical, they were, you know, drought affected cull cows, um, not long weaned calves and being fed in, um, in actually a confinement area on pretty low quality feed. Um, you can see it's um, quite a terrible looking um, specimen there. And I remember going to the abattoir that day and then um, all the workers saying, what's your trial? What are you trying to achieve here? Because I just couldn't believe we'd, um, you know, trying to get something out of this. But this gives us our, our control um, animal right the way through to our eight weeks on feed. And you can see that the marbling appearing in that animal now, now, it looks like a bit darker meat, but that's just the camera. That's just the image itself. Um, and you can also see the rib fat um, developing quite white fat compared to this yellow fat uh, for, that, for that early animal. These are the carcasses hanging up themselves. And you can see that, you know, after four weeks, we've had quite a significant shift in, in fat colour. Um, and then and we had quite a significant shift in yield as we, as we progress through as well. So we increase quality and we increase yield. So... <clears throat> We can see that in pictures and that's that's really good. What does it tell us um, in actual, well, what's the economics of it? What's the practicalities of this whole um, feeding these cows for a longer period of time? What we saw over time was quite significant, or I shouldn't, I shouldn't say significant, we saw quite large weight gains. So average daily weight gains of these cows in that first week where they were refilling their guts, basically you had a lot of gut fill, um, because uh, they had access to water and, and high quality food, they, they put on a lot of weight. In that first week we saw weight gains of, you know, that's seven kilos a day, which is not, you know, physiologically possible, but it was all about getting them back into, um, back into production. Over that first four weeks on average, you know, close on four kilos per head per day in live weight gain. We saw that decline, and this is an important point in this whole talk, is that after six weeks on food, they actually slowed down a bit in terms of their their um, live weight gain, the average daily live weight gain. But when we, oops, sorry, I'll just go back. I'll get used to this. When we look at their um, final live weight, the, the line above the live weight gain here on the slide, you can see that they were starting to hit their, their um, sort of mature weight anyway. So they went from, you know, 620 kilos to 630 kilos in those last couple of weeks. So that's kind of what we expect. We, we, they're going to slow down. And so it's trying to pick that, that nice sweet point where we get weight gain because that's what we want on these cattle, but then we also get a quality product out the other end. When we go to this next slide, this is all about the quality in the carcass. And this is the real focus of this project. So weight gain, we knew we'd get weight gain on these cows and we knew they'd be worth more money than, um, than when they started. But if we look at actual quality, an interesting point here is our intramuscular fat. So what we, we took meat samples and, and we processed them through the lab to get chemical intramuscular fat. So 
when we look at the 56 days on feed, so the eight weeks on feed, we get up to about 70% IMF in these cows compared to um, the six weeks on feed where there's 12% IMF. If we compare that to the, uh, oh, sorry, it's meant to come up with the other side, the Osmeet Marble School, which is in the middle of that, uh, that table there, we only saw them reaching the marble scores one and a bit over one. We had a few twos and you can see how that averages out over the group. What we're hoping to see is in the consumers is, is can the consumers pick up the difference in the IMF, chemical IMF percentage in these carcasses and therefore actually see a difference in that eight weeks feeding. If we just went solely off the osmic grading, then we don't see it. We don't see a difference. When we look at the MSA marble score, there's not, a, there's not a significant difference between six weeks and eight weeks on food. But what we did see was an increase in the number of carcasses that graded. So when we start thinking about this from a risk management point of view, if we're gonna feed cows and we want them to grade MSA for a particular market, then feeding them for this 56 days gives us a lot better risk management around, around feeding these cattle. So 84% of them graded. Um, we only had um, one or two carcasses that didn't grade under the MSA scheme. So um, an index is of 52 and, and we had a lot of markets around uh, the last few years, actually for a number of years um, up in Northern New South Wales uh, who, were, who were taking MSA graded cows and, um, and, and putting their primals into different markets into China and, and overseas. So if you look at this from a risk management point of view, you would start to say, well, six weeks gives us our efficiency sort of um, gains, but eight weeks manages our quality. And that's all we can say at this time, start, uh, for this part of this project. Now, when it comes down to economics, I was going to, we've been mucking around with um, developing an economic model, and, and that includes things like labour and, and potentially one of the aspects we started to discuss was do we include infrastructure? So for the talk today, I wanted to keep it really simple. Everyone's gonna have different infrastructure, everyone's gonna have different labor um, requirements, the whole bit, cost of food, the whole bit. What I focused on here was simply a margin over feed cost. So we had a feed cost, and then how much margin over that cost did we get per cow? And if we had a profit, then you'd have to work out whether you can afford to pay your labour for that. And if there was any you know, depreciation on infrastructure or repairs and maintenance and fuel, et cetera, on all your machinery and so forth. So to work this out, it actually um, it sounded really simple to start with, but then it became a bit more complicated when we started looking at the price grids um, for cows. So if we just looked at a base price and said, okay, this is what the cows are worth as a base price at $4 per kilo carcass weight. Now, now cows are worth a lot more than that now. Um, they've, they've spiked a lot this year compared to last year. Um, you can see that our profit, our margin, I shouldn't say that profit, that's a really bad word to say, our margin over feed cost, it's not our profit at all, our margin over feed cost decreased after four weeks on feed. So we get those big increases in, um, in weight gain um, they're very efficient early in that four weeks period. They become less efficient as we feed them for a bit longer. So therefore they consume a bit more feed um, than the weight gain they're putting on at a base price. If we actually said, okay, for all those carcasses that grade under, MS, uh, under MSA, we'll give a 50 cent per kilo premium. Now that's what was around um, in some of these um, markets in, in Northern New South Wales. You can see that with the quality grade on there, so not just the weight gain, the quality grade, our margin over feed cost actually increases um, through to the eight weeks. So it's so almost $100 um, margin over feed cost at the eight weeks feeding period compared to $57 at the 28 day feeding. And that's just solely from more carcasses grading MSA. If I, get, if I revert back to the actual grid price at the time that we sold these cattle, so they're all locked in on the one grid, the grid differentiates on minor quality traits. So things like meat colour, a um, bit of rib fat, etc. So did they meet their standard market specs a, a little bit better? And they, they, we saw that basically margin over feed cost still decreased from 28 days to 56 days. We, we got a better price per kilo for these cows um, than our $4 per kilo carcass weight. So if we actually start selling on certain grids, and the point here is to actually understand the grid that we're gonna sell these cows onto, then, um, and then uh, we can possibly only feed them for four weeks and, and, and have more margin over our feed cost. But if we actually put the MSA premium on that actual grid, you can see this is our big gains. This is where the big gains come from, that we've got more cattle grade in MSA, we're getting a premium for them, and 
that it's all around that quality product. So I'm going to throw it out there. If we're not, not getting value for our quality, we're not getting paid for our quality at the other end, then we're probably going to be only feeding them for a short period of time. If we're chasing a high quality product, it's going to be for that, that eight weeks. Very good. Oh, now the, the lines start working. Sorry about that. Um, they were meant to be on the other sides too. All right, Michael, I might just uh, rush you along a little bit. Here. Yeah, sorry, here we go. Um, so that's what it all comes down to is all around um, getting quality uh, beef out the other end. And we see some brands out there like this vintage beef company that um, Greenham's have got uh, and, and extracting value out of these cow cows. And just the last one is to just acknowledge the funding from MLA for this project. Thanks for that, Tom. Perfect. Thanks for, uh, for jamming those last four slides in nice and quickly. I'm going to hand over to John Medway now. Um, while I'm handing over to John Michael, there was just a question from Jasira on ossification. Uh, Jasira wanted to know if the, the cattle going through had similar os scores. Um, yeah, just wondering about age, I suppose. Yeah, so, so what we saw, Jasira, was not a significant difference in ossification scores across the whole lot. The, the only the difference, it, it was actually surprising. So we've got um, in the paper in the proceedings shows ossification for those day zero cows was actually at 590 os, um, which was different from our 28 and 42 days um, cows. But it was not significantly different from our 56 day cows. Um, so it, it, well, yeah, it's an interesting question. We don't we didn't actually see a significant change in ossification due to feeding period. Yeah, hard to stratify on ossification too, isn't it? When you you can't cut them open before you start the trial. So, yeah, correct. And and one of the the, the aspects to investigate is actually could we, yeah, how much do we change cows physiologically by putting them on high feed, high feed, high quality feed diets at this later stage in their life? Um, and we haven't really um, captured that in this study. Thanks a lot, Michael. Um, you do have one other question to to answer there in the Q and A section. If you could tap an answer in there, that'd be great. And we'll move on to John Medway. Once again, just quickly, apologies, but we are cramped for time today, um, trying to get as much information out as possible. So I'm going to introduce John. John is uh, with the Graham Centre and has an interest in precision livestock. And today he'll be talking to you all about some of his activities uh, with the Graham Centre. John. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, so today is probably more of an introduction rather than a report on um, on activity because we're really only just kicking off in the last few months. Um, and yeah, just talking about where we're up to with some of the precision livestock activities and, and digital agriculture. So there was a fairly major report back in 2017 that identified that digital ag more broadly has got a potential to add about $20 billion to the total on-farm value of, of, of ag production. Um, but if we're going to achieve that, there's, there's a number of issues that need to be dealt, dealt with. The first one is just what is the value that comes out of all the different technologies that we're, that we're talking about? How do we deal with connectivity issues around, around farms and being able to transfer data? How do we bring farmers up to speed with um, their digital skills? Um, what's the access to data? And where do the decision support tools come from that actually enable um, us to make sense of the information? And, and very much in order to achieve all those things, it's, it's, it's all about having an integrated approach. And so here on the CSU farm, and perhaps there's a, a few people out there that don't actually recognise or, or realise that the where CSU sits was part of the experimental farm that was established in 1892. So we've been dealing with agricultural research education extension here for um for 128 years now so it's um it's been going and the the farm's been evolving throughout that time and so here in, in 2020 the farm's grown out to be about 1600 hectares of, of commercial farm activity there's um 400 cows and, and 2000 ewes that go with uh, the various cropping activities that are mostly dry land, but there is a bit of um, irrigated cropping and pasture activity. There's horticulture and viticulture areas, um, as well as a, an area of the farm that's allocated to, to research activities. And over the last six, eight months, we've been developing a plan on how do we bring all this, infam all this sort of resource together uh, in the digital ag platform? How do we present all this information to the 
maths and computing guys to uh, to look at machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, virtual reality, augmented reality, all, all those sorts of things. Ultimately, so we can get towards or get to a, get to a point where we can start using the using this information and reaching the the potential that we um that we know that it has. When we're, we're talking about a, a digital farm, in, in the first instance, that's setting up a network of, of sensors around the farm. So weather sensors, soil moisture sensors, um, sensors on gates and tanks and troughs in vehicles, sort of a relatively standard issue sensor network that's out there these days that allows a whole range of types of information to be collected. Spatially, in the first instance, after we've put together a fairly decent um, and high resolution farm map is to get out and understand the, the soils of the farm, because that's what Lars is driving the, the pastures and, uh, and, and crops that, that everything's revolving around. So using conductivity sensors, radiometrics, magnetics, a whole range of different things to develop high resolution maps of the, uh, of the farm soil resource that we have. Um, most people are getting aware that since the 70s, the US has been taking a multi-spectral image of the entire planet every couple of weeks, and all that data is now online, so it's possible to delve back into that information, collect multiple years of information, then generate an average productivity picture based on, on sort of plant growth or, or plant vigour. And so we can generate a map that says, on average for each paddock, where are the most productive and least productive areas. So then from the agronomy point of view, we can go out and start soil sampling and looking at how do we manage our, our crops and pastures spatially to be, uh, to be getting more from them. In addition to all that historic information, there's, there's also now a network of, of satellites that we can be collecting satellite data at relatively high resolution, um, sort of down to about three metres on a daily basis. Um, here in the CSU, we've got a fairly extensive list of uh, or collection of drones with a whole range of different sensors. Um, and there's a whole stack of commercial drone services out there as well that, that are now talking about being able to collect data down to a 0.3 of a millimetre and run that through machine learning to count insects and, and some really quite outrageous sort of detail that, that can be generated from this sort of, um, this sort of information. And, and as that information all starts together, um, we're also in some discussions with a couple of our automated uh, autonomous vehicle manufacturers to, uh, to get some automated technology here on the farm to, to really just be demonstrating how, how some of this stuff comes together from a, from a crops and pasture perspective. Um, when we look at pastures a bit more specifically, um, we've just recently started looking at how do we most accurately um, and reliably assess the pastures from just a from a quantity and a, and a quality perspective. So we're using a, a pasture height sensor to be able to sort of drive across a paddock and measure plant height and then sort of calibrate that against biomass and then see how that then compares against some of the different satellite based um, biomass estimates that are now starting to be out there. Um, again, all looking at you, how do we refine our feed budgeting? How do we refine our, our pasture agronomy and, and the, the management of both the livestock and the, and the plants to, uh, to increase the availability and, and utilisation of the feed that we're producing? For the last uh, couple of months, we've we've um, had a bit of a, a test run with our, the first of our GPS uh, collar devices. So we've got 20 of the Munator GPS collars uh, on some Angus cows. Uh, the first couple of months all about how do we just collect and manage the information. Um, but for the last uh, month now, we've had, had the collars on some um, Angus heifers looking at how do we monitor um, and, and, and collect information uh, to, to then analyse about animal health, um, animal behaviour for the um, around uh, reproduction and, and calving. The sensors themselves have got um, two little solar panels either side of the data collector and they're measuring an activity uh, record for each animal every four seconds during the day. So assessing whether the animal is walking, resting or grazing. And every five minutes is uh, turning on a GPS and, and grabbing a location and uploading that da a, da a daily summary of that data um, via satellite to the cloud. But at the moment, we're also going out every few weeks and just downloading the, the bulk data that's, that's being stored. 
Um, and that data just allows us to look at the that four second record to then look at how do we then tie that information against the the behaviour and activities and and health of the animals, um, as well as just basic maps of, of where the animals are. Um, at a slightly different scale, um, early next year we um, have got plans um, and sort of finalising the project now to fit 400 um, GPS tags, uh, series tags onto the onto um, yeah, 400 cows. Um, these particular units are much smaller and just fit on the back of the, the animal's ear, essentially collecting all the same amounts of data um, and, and again, feeding that into a database to then say, well, okay, how do we collate all this information, uh, work with the, with the vets and the, the PhD students to then understand what the information is telling us. And then also looking at how do we then integrate the location information with the farm record data to then start looking at traceability and provenance and, and also the particular trial with the series tags is looking at using the tags specifically as uh, the recognised um, sort of uh, electronic identification. And the idea is that, that ultimately as an animal leaves a farm, its location history can then just extract from the farm records what are the relevant um, you know, pasture management, sustainability, sort of ecological um, indicators that need to go with that carcass to um, give it a sustainability um, index, to, to give it provenance and, and, and ultimately the, the whole traceability. And so really most of these activities are, are only just sort of kicking off in the over the last few months. Um, we're only just starting now with the, with the tags being on the heifers for a month to uh, be able to look at the data around calving to see what sort of indicators there might be in that to, uh, to assist with the different uh, management activities. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certainly plenty of plans for being able to bring all this stuff together. And, and it is very much about an, an integrated approach is that we don't wanna be looking at the, 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 um, the cattle information or the, the, the sheep information in isolation. It's all about linking up the, the livestock information with the, with the pastures, with the soils, with the weather, the markets, the, the, the whole box and dice in trying to uh, bring it all together. And so it's it's very much about creating some awareness that the activity is going on on here at CSU, and we'll be really keen to hear from any producers that are interested in in participating in this sort of work, uh, any experiences they might had, um, and researchers and companies that are looking at yeah how might they be able to collaborate with the with the resource that we've got here at CSU to uh, to further our precision livestock activities. And I think, Tom, that's about the 10 minutes. So, yeah, do we have time for some questions? Yeah, look, uh, we've got a couple of minutes probably for one question. And while we're waiting for people to tap away, I might just pick your brains on the, the GPS tags for next year. Um, do, do, they, do we have any capability for sort of looking at mothering up with those as well? So as well as getting that movement and feed intake data, can we start uh, pairing up our, our calves and cows using this technology? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's certainly a couple of different options there. So even just using proximity sensors. So, so I know the uni has a number of of those. Um, there's a whole range of different applications in, in how we do that. Certainly, it'd be very nice from a traceability perspective to be able to get some uh, tags onto some young calves to then be able to look at at not only the proximity between the animals, but also yeah, where, where are they located in the field and, and how it's all coming together. So certainly that, that's one of the one of the many topics that's on the uh, on the list of activities, Tom. Yeah, brilliant. Excellent. Well, look, I'll, thank you very much, John. Um, I think we're just about ready to, to hand over to Kath. So if anyone pops up some uh, questions in the Q&A, we can try and field them and John can field them during the session. Um, Kath, okay. Kath's coming on now. Uh, I will find her slides and give her a quick introduction. Um, look, Cass joining us today from, from DPI in Trangy and is going to talk to us about uh, some genomic evaluation across breeds. So let me click open and hopefully this all works as planned. Perfect, I love it when things go right. So Cass, I'll hand over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone this morning, although it's not in person, it's still lovely to be able to, to interact. So today um, I'm a little bit um, 
like our previous speaker, going to give you a flavour of a project that's just starting. So we don't have um, any results to discuss yet, but to give you a flavour of um, a project which will be running over the next five years and hopefully um, at some stage we can um, get back to you with some, some outcomes um, that may be of interest to the industry. So this project is the Southern Multibead Project. It's a large beef genetics project which is funded by um, MLA, uh, DPI and also UNE through the National Livestock Genetics Consortium. So bef before I get into the actual details and nuts and bolts of what we'll be doing um, in the project, I thought it's interesting to give a background and rationale as to why the beef industry believes this. Um, oh, I've just, all the slides are still there. Can everyone still see the slides? Good. Um, why the beef industry believes this um, issue um, is something that is worth funding and worth um, putting time and energy into addressing. Um, the, there are two main angles that this project is coming at. One of it is addressing the changing nature of trait recording within the beef industry. Um, so, for example, in the seed stock industry, we've seen relatively low levels of recording for fertility traits in beef herds probably in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, it's a reflection of the greater use of AI programs and synchronisation of females. Um, so, when we look at our fertility trait of days to calving from a genetic evaluation point of view, um, that trait is associated associated with natural matings and it's the length of time it takes for a female to fall pregnant once she's been exposed to the bull. Obviously under AI programs we can't measure that trait and the low levels of recording have um, led to little genetic variation and um, which means we have little um, capacity uh, to change that trait um, using genetics. Um, we also have relatively low levels of recording for very hard to measure traits, which is unexpected. These are usually traits that are expensive to measure, um, require particular circumstances or um, setups and um, a lot of intensive um, recording for the traits to be measured successfully. And their traits like feed efficiency, methane, and some of these, uh, for example, feed efficiency is obviously very important and some will play greater roles in the future. So to have um, high levels of quality data of these traits for the beef industry is important. And we're also seeing over time the increasing importance to our consumers, um, the end users of our product, of health and welfare traits. Um, so, you know, the beef industry has given um, feedback to, to MLA that they would like to address this um, recording levels in particular traits and also the changing trait emphasis over time um, and to create a resource population where we can um, record those type of traits successfully in large numbers of animals. There has also been, um, been feedback that there is a, a market failure um, for people who are interested in uh, comparing bulls from different breeds um, for their genetic merit. So if you go out to buy a bull right now to join to your cows in a few months' time, you, if for instance, you weren't quite sure whether you might be interested in an Angus bull or a Hereford bull, you might go along to the two different um, studs on their bull sale days. You might look at the bull himself and then look at in the catalogue um, at the descriptors of his genetic merit for traits of interest. And you can see, um, for instance, for the Angus bull in the little box beside him, um, the estimated breeding values, which are our industry um, descriptors of genetic merit. You may have a look at those and look at the ones of interest to you. You know, a week later, you may go along to um, a Hereford breeder's full sale, look at the bull himself, and then also look at the catalogue and investigate the estimated breeding values uh, for traits of particular interest to you. One thing you'll note is that every breeder has a different way of presenting this information. So, um, you know, certainly not always um, comparable even within a breed. But um, the biggest limitation is that currently we can't compare, for instance, a birth weight EBV um, or estimated breeding value for gen uh, descriptor of his genetic merit. In an Angus bull, we can't compare that directly with the same estimated breeding value in a Hereford bull. All estimated breeding values currently are only comparable within breeds. 
Uh, certainly, the beef industry has given us feedback that this is market failure. Um, that they wish to have the capacity to be able to compare um, animals across breeds for genetic improvement purposes. And also um, the fact that we can't compare animals is means that uh, the genetic improvement program of breed plan has limited usefulness for crossbreeding producers. So there is hope that the outcomes of this project will mean that the same person going to buy a bull in 2025 uh, from two different breeds will be able to um, look at a set of animals from one breed, a set of animals from another breed, and those um, estimated breeding values for a particular trait will be directly comparable. However, for this to happen, what we do need is animals and not just a few animals, we need a large number of animals in a well-designed project to be born and recorded under the same environments to be able to statistically analyse the data so that we have a multi-breed genetic analysis. So that leads us in very nicely into the objectives of this Southern Multibreed Project. Um, the first objective listed there addresses that um, trait recording scenario I mentioned on my first slide, um, where the objective is to develop a multi-breed resource population uh, to collect high quality data on hard to measure traits in beef cattle. Um, for instance, the fertility traits where I mentioned there's low level levels of recording, also novel traits that are becoming increasingly important uh, to the beef industry. Uh, another objective also is to uh, generate those head-to-head -head comparisons between different breeds to be able to ultimately underpin a breed plan temperate multi-breed evaluation and the output from that genetic evaluation would be EBVs directly comparable across the breeds involved in the project. And finally, by um, recording all these traits, including standard traits and novel traits, and then genotyping the animals uh, in the project, we will be able to develop a resource population of highly recorded individuals um, to be useful for future projects. So moving on to the project design to give you a few details, the project length is five years running from 2020. So the uh, project is just starting um, up until 2024. Throughout the project, purebred females will be joined to purebred bulls to produce purebred calves. The heifers from these um, joinings will be retained on each of the sites involved in the project and then join themselves. They will be joined via natural mating to generate that fertility data that we need, as well as collecting many other traits of interest along the way. And those heifers will be joined for at least three times, depending on when they're born within the project. The steer, male progeny generated in the project will be uh, made into steers and then they'll be backgrounded, put through the feedlot to generate traits like feed efficiency and then slaughtered. Uh, to obtain carcass data. And this project is being led by New South Wales DPI, funded um, jointly with MLA under the um, NLGC, the National Livestock Genetics Consortium, and also via UNE, the University of New England. So what breeds are involved in this project? Um, the breeds were specifically chosen to represent those who had the highest breed plan registrations in Southern Australia. So the breeds are involved include the Angus breed, Charolais, Hereford, Shorthorn and Wagyu breeds. And those are located at, we have um, five sites, with, um, which I'll highlight in one of the future slides, five sites in the project. And those breeds are not, a, not every breed at every site, but represented at least at, one, at two sites. We also have the Brahmin breed um, represented in the project at one site only, and that is at Grafton. The reason for the inclusion of the Brahman breed is that it links nicely into another MLA funded project known as the Repronomics Project up in Northern Australia. So we have direct links between two major um, genetics um, projects within Australia. The selection of the AI size from each of the, um, each of the different breeds to join to our base cows that um, we've been joining, will be joining for the next four years, um, has been done to try and represent the full diversity of um, genetic material across the different breeds that we have involved in the project. 
and in mating allocation between those AI sires and then backup bulls with our um, base cows has been um, completed using the program Mate Cell uh, and predominantly looking at avoidance of inbreeding. As I mentioned, we have five different sites that our animals are being run in to try and represent as diverse a range of environments as possible for this project. These are all New South Wales DPI research stations, and they range from Camden, um, so Menangle, just um, southwest of Sydney, uh, out to the west, Trangy, where I'm located. Um, we also have Tokau, which is just north of Newcastle, and then up to the northern Tablelands, where we have cows running at Glen Innes, and then across to the coast at Grafton. We also will be using um, DPI research stations at Wallenbar to background steers prior to going into the feedlot. There will be many traits recorded on these animals throughout the project, and the traits that I list in front of you here is not a finite list, as more traits are suggested or become um, important um, throughout the life of the project, will we certainly be adding to them? This is more a starting point. All the standard breed plan growth traits you can see in the left column um, under growth will be recorded. Um, rebirth and reproduction certainly recorded throughout the life of the project, as well as carcass and eating quality. Some of the novel traits um, that we'll be recording to try and address that lack of recording in that area include um, methane, eating quality, NFI, which is the industry measure of feed efficiency. Um, we've also got temperature, structure, behaviour, um, some health and welfare traits included on this list, faecal egg count, bovine respiratory disease. All of the animals in the project will be genotyped with the 50K equivalent chip, and this will uh, enable us to have a resource population intended to facil facilitate collaboration and the ability to record other traits. So this slide here just gives you um, a bit of a feel for the flow of animals in the project. Um, we're just having our first calves on the ground at the moment being born. So our first joining occurred in 2019. The, the base cows were joined for the first time. Those base cows will be joined for four years. So starting last year, again this year, and then 2021 and 2022. As I've mentioned, the female progeny from those base cows will be retained on site and themselves will be joined for at least three opportunities, depending on when they're born in the project. And that uh, mating of the female progeny is via natural joining. The male progeny will become steers through the feedlot and slaughtered. So where are we now? Uh, I've mentioned we've just got calves on the ground at all five sites now have just started calving. Um, I mentioned earlier that to be able to uh, conduct the, the um, genetic evaluation across breeds, we needed a well-designed project that compared breeds from uh, animals from different breed head to head, and it needed to be a large number of animals. You can see that this year we'll be calving in total just over 1,400 cows, and this is at five different sites. For instance, the Angus breed, we're calving just over 450 calves, and they're located at all five sites associated with the project. We're calving 85 Brahmin cows at Grafton, just over 130 Charolais cows at Tokal and EMAI, um, 340 Hereford cows at four sites, just under 200 Shorthorn cows at um, Tokal and EMAI, and finally just over 200 Wagyu cows at three of the sites. So this has been a massive um, undertaking in the last two years, and um, as we're roughly probably one third of the way through carving now. So um, yes, well and truly underway. So where to from here? Uh, as I mentioned, those base cows that um, are currently carving will then be joined via AI um, for the next three years to generate progeny. Those female progeny um, uh, will be naturally mated on each of the sites. The male progeny are slaughtered and um, various traits recorded on both sets, female and male progeny. And 
Um, just out of interest there for people who may see this project and see how um, something they're interested in might fit in with, with your plans or your thoughts, there's a huge potential for value adding for this project via overlay projects, that re research ideas that other people may have um, that could this population could be used for and could contribute to the project. Finally, before I um, turn over for questions, just some acknowledgements, particularly to our funding providers, uh, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, MLA and UNE, and the project team associated with this project, Paul Arthur, Brad Wormsley, Jason Sedell, Tracy Bird Gardner, EGO Chen and Tom Granlease, and most importantly, the management and staff at all those New South Wales DPI research sites who handle the day-to-day -day activities of the cattle. Thank you. Thanks, Kath. Um, it sounds like you're about to move into a huge amount of work over the next five years. So <laughs> yes, very busy was, times ahead. It was nice meeting you now, and I'm sure I won't hear from you for a little while. But, <laughs> well, um, hope, hopefully in a few years' time with some results. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got one question here from, from Michael. Uh, he was interested in how this compares with the IGS, or the, the International Genetic Solution, that's currently being uh, used in the States. So they've got a multi-breed plan system over there. Um, yeah, is there any benefits to, to the breed plan analysis here or? Oh, certainly, I guess it's, um, this is for the Australian industry um, yep. and on in local conditions um, and local local breeds. So, um, certainly, I guess this is, this is for the Australian, um, yeah, this is the research to be able to underpin a genetic evaluation. Um, the actual statistical um, tools used to produce that genetic evaluation um, you know, may or may not um, follow similar methodology to, to other, um, other analyses, but this project is all about generating the data to then underpin such a statistical analysis. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. And we've got a couple of other questions in the uh, in the chat. So if you would be so kind as to field those uh, while I bring up the next slides. No, I don't bring up the next slides. Our next uh, speaker is unfortunately unavailable. She's decided that she needed to get to Queensland before the border shut. Uh, so I'll introduce Veronica and find her video. We've got a recording. And Veronica is a PhD student here in Wagga Wagga with the uh, with the Graham Centre in the School of Animal and Veterinary Sciences and is supervised by Jane Quinn and Michael Campbell. Um, I'll click play and see if it plays for us. Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Today I'll be talking to you about the utilisation um, of bobby calves for beef production. I'd like to thank my supervisors, Jane Quinn, Anthony Saliba, and Michael Campbell for the ongoing support. So let's start with an industry issue um, that's quite large. So we have a number of excess males in the dairy industry, which is a problem, as this has led to multiple euthanasias of calves. To overcome this, we need to identify rearing strategies to help enter them into a beef supply chain. However, this is where we hit another industry issue. And this is because we have a limited supply chain available for these calves to enter. So how do we overcome this? A potential solution could be to look at optimal growth paths that will lead to eating quality outcomes that consumers are willing to purchase. This could align with a product, again, that consumers are willing to purchase so we can identify a dairy beef supply chain in Australia that is sustainable. Currently, there are three different pathways that dairy calves can enter. So male calves can obviously be transported at 10 days old and become Bobby Veal products. They can go to calf roos or be reared on the dairy farm and are commonly um, sold as a beef product as veal or rosé veal. These are what we see currently in Australia and it's estimated that 400,000 replacement, non-replacement calves go into this system. Overseas though, there are two other supply chains that are commonly used and we do not see here in Australia. This is that once reared, the calves go to a backgrounder or finishing property and they're graded as a beef product or they have a feedlot finish and are graded as a grain fed product. It is estimated that 40% of Holstein steers in America undergo this feedlot process. So in Australia, why can't we go from a calf 
a male calf to a fully grown steer. So to recap, we have this industry issue of an excess of excess male calves within our dairy industry. Through identifying current, re current rearing strategies by talking to dairy producers, we can reduce euthanasia practices. Through this, we can create a, a viable dairy beef supply chain through evidence-based research that will find optimal growth paths, align this with eating quality outcomes that are optimal for consumers, create valuable products, beef products, and this will secure our license to continue operating within the dairy industry. Through this, hopefully we can create a viable dairy beef supply chain in Australia. Thank you. And thank you, Veronica, for um, putting that video together um, in your absence. Just a reminder that if you've got any questions for her, Michael Campbell will be happy to, to field those in the Q&A section. Uh, and if you want to contact anyone that's in our session today, please uh, have a look in your proceedings and you should be able to find some contact information and some further information on the projects there. We're going to move on now to Bridget Logan. So I'll invite you to turn on your camera, please. I'll hit play. Now, Bridget joins us from uh, DPI in Cowra. And she is going to talk to us about uh, verifying the production system of origins for grass and grain fed beef. Excellent. I'll hand over to you, Bridget. Thanks, Tom. So I'm a CSU PhD student and I'm be focusing on grass fed verification systems and just wanted to give a quick snapshot of the research that's been conducted as part of this. So maintaining accountability within the beef supply chain is a major cost processes and producers in the form of auditing and has an even greater potential cost if there is a failure in the audit process. Therefore, there became the need for an objective method to verify production, which can be used to guarantee premium big products from Australia. So the tool that we kind of proposed is Raman spectroscopy, and this is a technology that provides a chemical fingerprint of a sample. So it's a measurement of the vibration of molecules on high intensity light is provided at the sample and provides the spectra which contains information about the chemical bonds. Graphic spectroscopy was a technology that is widely used in the identification of illicit substances and explosives and is commonly used in airports. So essentially, it's a laser pointed at a sample that causes molecules to wiggle and then provides information on what is in the sample based on which wavelength causes the most wiggling. Um, so this technology is suited for verifying beef production systems as it is a rapid, non-destructive and available as a portable handheld device. So the aim of this study was to see if we can viably use this technology to discriminate between production systems. So by examining the split of data samples across the principal component analysis, it can be seen that long-term grain-fed cattle can be successfully identified from other production systems, shown by in this image by the red diamonds. So modelling demonstrates Raman spectroscopy's ability to split the feeding groups based solely on the collected spectra. So the long grain-fed samples are separated from the grass and grass supplement samples, and the short grain are mostly mixed within that long grain area. So further investigation on the samples not being identified in the PCA has been conducted, but is not shown currently here. So we use partial least squares discriminant analysis to classify these into groups. So by doing this, we've actually been able to look at this misclassification error. And particularly, these mostly are occurring between the blue and green triangles, which are your grass and grass supplemented. So this further modelling has enabled the discrimination of these feed groups of between 93 to 95% accuracy. So that's when you get a group of cattle, you can use this technology and building on our model, we have a 95, 93 to 95% chance of getting it right. So then we also compared just using grain versus grass as their classifiers to combine the grass and grass supplemented versus the grain and grain long and grain short. So with that, we increased our model accuracy between 96 to 99%, with very little samples being misclassified. 
So to build this model, we used a total of 520 beef carcasses, and these were sampled from a variety of production systems, um, including cattle based on a feedlot for 100 days, short term was 70 days, and the grass fed were on southern pastures, and grass supplemented were on the same pastures, but were also provided a pulse pellet. So our samples are taken at 24 hours post slaughter. So this is around the same time as breeding on the carcasses. So we try to line these up so they could be done in the same measurement. Um, so they were collected using a Raman handheld device on the subcutaneous fat at the point end of the brisket. So even using just a small portion of the fat, this technology is able to capture enough information that we've been able to use the model to discriminate between. So this research is intended to be used as a method of authentication of the claims of production for Australian beef products, destined predominantly for international markets. This technology has been developed into a tool that will be used on carcasses for Australian beef cattle, and again, designed to be used in combination with current grading techniques. So when the graders come through doing their assessments of pH and MSA grading techniques, this would be a potential tool to be used in that capacity. So Raman spectroscopy is able to provide an objective measurement of production system that can be used to ensure everyone in the supply chain is accountable. Currently, this technology is best able to predict the grain fed samples as the grass and grass supplemented are very similar. But utilizing this spectroscopy technique will provide clarity for producers, processors and consumers of the production claims of Australian beef products. So I'd just like to thank New South Wales DPI, Meat and Livestock Australia for funding this research. I'd also like to acknowledge Australian Meat Processing Corporation, the Graham Centre and the National Wine Grape Industries Centre for supporting this research and my scholarship. Thank you. Bridget, great presentation and some really nice outcomes. Having accuracy above 90% for anything is always a, a good mission, uh, even if you couldn't discern between grass and grass supplements. So. Um, I guess I'll just ask one quick question uh, before we play our final video. It, is there any other technology that you could potentially introduce to increase the amount of data you have to predict that grass versus grass supplement? So technology, I mean, there's a few pieces of technology that have been used in this way, but to the level of success we're finding with Raman and because we're able to get individual wavelengths that tell us specific information about the fatty acid composition, for instance, it's really mm. good. So a lot of the other technologies that we could bring in and we have used to verify that we are picking up the right thing, um, they're more laboratory um, intensive. So we're using those in combination, but they take a lot longer and won't be viable in an avatar setting. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's good that you're always thinking about that applied setting. So thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Look, we're, we're fairly on time. We've got one last video and we might leave the session at the end of the video. Um, so Liam has started a job this week, uh, so unfortunately couldn't join us. Um, he worked on looking at BRD and vaccination. So we're going to play a short video of his. Again, if you'd like to contact anyone that's been in this session, uh, please have a look at your proceedings or or get in touch with the Graham Centre and be sure to, to, to get in touch with them and, and have conversations about some of this excellent research. So thank you very much to all of our presenters for joining us in this session and thank you to all attendees. And we will now play Liam's video. Morning all, uh, this is my research snapshot of the trial we ran for my honours project last year, the health and production effects of single vaccination against Mannheimer hemolytica in non-backgrounded feedlot cattle. Just a quick refresher on BRD, it's a non-specific respiratory disease in cattle, typically cattle that are coming into the feedlot setting and highly stressed from mixing, handling and transport, uh, which allows various pathogens to come in and cause respiratory disease, which we typically see as coughing, nasal discharge and wheezing. And this is a big problem because it's estimated to cost the beef feedlot industry around 40 million each year in drug costs, mortality and loss in average daily gains. So currently in Australia, we have commercially available BRD vaccines for MH or menomia hemolytica and bovine herpes virus one. Uh, and 
previous research has indicated that vaccination against MHC either on farm or during a backgrounding period will typically have the best benefits for reducing the incidence of BRD once in the feedlot. But uh, where that isn't possible, there's always an opportunity to do a single vaccination against MH at feedlot induction, as well as utilisation of uh, BHB1 vaccine. So what we did was a randomised double-blind control trial. Uh, we inducted 1,571 steers and heifers over five weeks. They were all non-backgrounded, mixed sex, breed, origin, age and weight. And uh, this was a commercial feedlot in southeast Queensland. Uh, cattle were randomly allocated to treatment groups, that being either a control or a single vaccination with either bovillus or baby shield. They also received rhino guard and arrest and were fed a total mixed ration for 60 to 70 days. And clinical BRD cases were pulled based on a case criteria. Uh, then we calculated the average daily gain, uh, excluded outliers, and statistically we used a mixed linear model with fixed and random effects to account for clustering of groups. So overall, the incidence of clinical BRD during the trial was 1.65%, which is quite low, which is really a good thing, but the distribution of BRD um, was spread quite evenly between the three groups. And because the incidence was so low, we unfortunately couldn't make any uh, statistical uh, conclusions about the effect of single vaccination on the incidence of BRD. What we did find, though, was an increase in average daily gain amongst both vaccinated groups um, compared to the control group. And this was statistically significant in the bovillus group, but not as significant in the bovishield group. And uh, the, the, the low incidence of clinical BRD cases may have been due to all animals being vaccinated with BHV1, which is about a BRD pathogen itself that's also found to play a significant role in the proliferation of MH. Uh, the, the increased average daily gain in vaccinated groups, uh, while still having a low incidence of clinical BRD, may have been due to uh, decreased subclinical BRD in the, in the vaccinated cattle. And the best way to investigate this further would be to repeat the trial and undertake lung scoring at the time of processing to determine any subclinical disease. And as well as this, culture and serology would be useful to confirm which pathogens were involved. And of course, repeating the trial in different feedlots and getting tr uh, larger trial numbers would help increase our confidence in single MH vaccination on backgrounded cattle by getting a better indication on the statistical significance. That's all. Thank you. So thank you very much to uh, Liam for putting that together. Um, now, before anyone jumps off, I have, I'm have i hoping you're looking at your, your schedule better than I am because I have completely missed an office mate of mine, Emma Lynch. Emma Lynch joins us if you would like to turn on your video, Emma. Emma Lynch joins us uh, from Wagga and she's been looking at canola meal as a grass-fed supplement in, uh, in cattle systems for her PhD project. So Emma, if you would be so kind as to turn your video on, we will get into your slides. Apologies for um, <laughs> leaving you off the list. Thanks, Tom. All righty. Um, th thanks, Tom, for forgetting about me. Um, so we'll get straight into it. So today I'm just going to look at the responses to very inclusion levels of canola meal as a supplement. All righty. So... There's a, as we know, there's an increasing demand for grass-fed beef. Consumers perceive uh, grass-fed beef as a natural or a premium product, and they're willing to pay more for this beef. As so imagine you're all as producers. What if I told you changing your management strategy and selling your animals as certified either grass-fed or PCAS, uh, you could receive premiums well and truly above 20% per cents per kilo. Would you consider it? However, like most farming decisions, nothing is that easy. As we have, uh, as we know, um, during the summer autumn period around the Riverina, we experience pastures which are often low in quality and also in quantity. Therefore, what would you normally do if you had a low quality pasture during this time? Normally, uh, you would probably supplement with a traditional grain or a grain-based pellet or something similar. 
However, if you do this, you can't, we have a problem, you can't receive these grass-fed premiums. So what is a potential solution? Well, why not look at protein supplementation? As we know, protein supplements uh, can lead to increased growth rates and also drive dry matter intake. So the protein supplementation, protein supplement I'm uh, investigating is canola meal. So canola meal comes from the oil refinery process. Not only does canola meal have a high uh, crude protein percentage, but I think a lot of people forget it is also really, very high in energy as well. Um, and of course, it is relatively um, is also available around the Riverina. Now, if we have a look into the literature and we what and you try to work out how much to feed, well, the current feeding recommendations are anywhere between 0.3 to 3 kilos per head per day. And of course, this varies depending on the age of the animal and also the weight of the animal. So we had to come up, so my research question, we had to come up with, well, what inclusion rate should we actually be feeding? So we did this in a controlled manner at the CSU feeding pens and we used canola hay to mimic that low quality roughage. And of course, we had to look what the animal responses were. So what were the results of my 84 wiener calves when we fed them for a total of 56 days? As you can see on the x-axis, I have my very, very inclusion rates of canola meal, all expressed as a percentage of live weight. The reason why we chose a percentage of live weight is very easy for producers like yourselves to adapt this to, the, to your weight and age of your animal. So as you can see, as the percentage of canola meal increased, so did our average daily gain. However, we did reach a saturation point and we knew we were going to find this, but we just weren't sure where. We got that at our one and a half percent. And as you can see, from a one and a half percent to our two percent um, inclusion rate, we had a decrease in our average daily gain. Now, this was also consistent with our dry matter intake. So our graph looked exactly the same as this. So to conclude, what were the ideal inclusion uh, rates for canola meal? So we're looking anywhere between that one and one and a half percent of live weight of your wiener calves. But we needed to still do a further economic analysis to verify this. Therefore, if you wean your win, if you, uh, sorry, therefore, if you wean your calves while the pasture quality is low and the, or the supply is low, uh, instead of supplementing with a traditional grain base pellet or a supplement or a grain, uh, why not make the switch to canola meal and receive those grass-fed premiums? And just thank you um, to all my supervisors and the Graham Centre and River and Oil for this work. Emma, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for giving us that presentation. Um, did you notice any, any changes in feed intake across your groups? Yeah, so pretty much as I was saying with the graph so up to that one and a half percent it all uh all increased our dry matter intake yep. and then once you hit that two percent they just did not like really did not want to eat that roughage i feel like just a complete overload of protein there so yeah 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 yep. so it's quite interesting but palatability wise um up to that one and a half percent it was clean and gone within like five ten minutes every day yeah yep. really well, look, thank you very much for staying on and listening to Emma's talk today. Uh, once again, a big thank you to all of our panellists. Uh, if you are interested in moving over to the dual purpose mixtures session, it should start right about now. Um, and I think we will all close up in this webinar and we'll see you there. If you have any further questions for our panellists, please contact them via their details in the proceedings. Thank you very much to everyone for joining us today.